Welcome to Difficult Dialogues, Voices from the Valley. I'm Lynn Pascarella, president of Mount Holyoke College. Difficult Dialogues is intended to bring voices from the valley to bear on some of society's most complex issues. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by Christopher Pyle, who's a professor of politics at Mount Holyoke College, and Bill Newman, who is a lawyer and director of Western Massachusetts ACLU, an author. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for inviting us. Pleasure. Issues of surveillance, privacy have been in the news. And I know, Professor Pyle, that you've raised issues about concerns over retaliation and people who blow the whistle. Some of those concerns are born from your own experience. I'm hoping that you can tell us about your experience as a whistleblower and the aftermath. I got off pretty lightly, but uh, when I disclosed the Army's surveillance of civilian politics in 1970, uh, nobody had really tried this before. Nobody had ever gone after an intelligence agency. And so we didn't know what to expect. And uh, in fact, nothing much happened at first. And then the military created a 50-man unit in the Pentagon whose sole job was to discredit me. Hmm. Um, they were unsuccessful. So they made up stories about my fathering four illegitimate children, to which I replied, I'd love to meet them. Can you arrange that, please? <laughs> and that issue went away very quickly. Mm. Uh, then they put me on Nixon's enemies list, which targeted me for a tax audit, mm. and discovered that I had overpaid by $154, and they had to give us the money back. <laughs> so uh, there were threats to prosecute me for espionage or treason, uh, but these were terrors for children. They didn't really bother me much. Mm. Uh, so I got off rather lightly. I didn't have to move to another country like mm. uh, Ed Snowden and mm -hmm. his uh, journalists. What was the process that you went through in trying to decide whether to blow the whistle? It was an easy decision. Did you agonize over it? Instantaneous. Mm. I was given a briefing at the headquarters of the U.S. Army Intelligence Command while I was a captain in Army Intelligence. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, my job was to teach constitutional law to counterintelligence agents. <laughs> and one of my sidelines was to teach a class called CONUS Intelligence and Spot Reports. Spot Reports, a five paragraph incident report. Mm -hmm. CONUS is the Army's acronym for continental United States. They have an acronym for everything. And uh, I had to make up the class because nobody told me what to teach. Mm -hmm. So I talked about the need to measure the height of bridges so your trucks don't get stuck under them when you go in to deal with a riot, and to measure the park, so how many pup tents you can pitch in a park, and to count the urinals in the local high school. Useful things, you know, to water the troops. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> Well, maybe, maybe you should tell them about the bridge coming into Northampton. You would be really helpful now. Very helpful. If you're going to invade Northampton to put down a riot uh, by the raging grannies, you definitely need uh, to, to measure that bridge. bridge. Many wise people have as underestimated that bridge mm -hmm. or overestimated it and lived to rue the day. Well, anyway, I was preaching this class and an officer came up to me afterwards and said, Captain Pyle, you don't know much about this, do you? And I said, no. What can you tell me? And he said, well, I was a special duty officer at Operations 4, CONUS Intelligence Section of the U.S. Army Intelligence Command. If you like, I can arrange a briefing. And he did. And I went into this labyrinth inside this big old black warehouse in Baltimore, Maryland, got my security badge, and we went down through these winding corridors into a brightly lit room where there were 13 teletype machines chattering away, reporting on political activity throughout the country. And we were taken inside a steel mesh cage in the middle of the room where there was a workbench all the way around the sides and shown a variety of things, including a mug book, actually four volumes of a mug book on people active in civil disorders. Hmm the anti-war movement, the civil rights movement, the Quakers, uh, Unitarian churches, you know, dangerous people like that. And uh, 
that was very nice. And then we were shown a stack of computer punch cards. In the old days, we fed computers with punch cards. You're too mm -hmm. young to remember all this, <laughs> but uh, I remember it vividly. And the top card on the deck had a five, a six paragraph uh, incident report that reported that Arlo Tatum, executive secretary of the uh, Central Committee for Conscientious Objectors, had given a speech at the University of Oklahoma about the legal rights of COs. I found that fascinating because that immediately told me that they were covering every college campus in the country, reporting on uh, perfectly lawful activity like Arlo's speech. And I knew Arlo because I'd been working with him uh, getting some people out of the Army as mm. CEOs. Uh, and so I turned to the, my briefers and I said, you fellows are doing terrific work. Have you got something I can show my students over at the intelligence school? And they tore off a five and a half foot long intelligence summary for the week of March 11 through 18, 1968. And it had the Unitarian Church and other groups that the Army had infiltrated. Mm. And uh, I took that with me in five copies, multicolored. And as we left the building, after turning in our security badges, I turned to a fellow instructor and said, when I get out of the Army, I'm going to write an article about this. Because it was perfectly clear to me that while these folks were really nice fellows, they were running the essential apparatus of a police state. And I didn't think we needed to spend our money on that. And I certainly didn't think it did anything for civil liberties. And it certainly could inhibit people in the exercise of constitutional rights. So when I got out of the Army a few months later, I wrote the article. Great. Now, Bill, since Chris went through his experience as a whistleblower, the <clears throat> nature and scope of surveillance has changed dramatically. We've got the case of Edward Snowden. Talk about that use of technology in surveillance and the implications for civil liberties. I, I think that a lot of people realize but don't quite appreciate the extent of how legal mechanisms devised 25 or 30 years ago to protect privacy are utterly insufficient to protect mm -hmm. privacy today. So, for example, when the law was first written, the Electronic Privacy Act, Electronic Communications Privacy Act was written, there's a provision that says that if an email is six months old or older, all that a prosecutor needs to do is write out a subpoena on his own. It's like writing mm -hmm. a prescription pad. It says, give it to me. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that at the time the law was passed, almost no one used email. And the few people who did didn't store it because it was hugely expensive to store mm -hmm. email. And so if you got an email, you read it and you deleted it because it was hugely expensive. The mm -hmm. idea that there would be 10 years of your emails on a server somewhere that a prosecutor could just go and mm -hmm. take and review at his or her pleasure, it was unthinkable. No one thought about it. Now, that's the law that was passed in 1986. It's still the law today. And prosecutors can still get all that information today. Mm -hmm. Look at uh, the, the review of, of, of uh, license plate readers mm. that are now being used. Every license plate in a given area, and there are thousands and thousands of areas, and the information can, can be compiled and can be stored forever and be, can be cross-referenced so that private corporations and law enforcement can, in fact, put together an entire story of every place you have been in the last three months, six months, year, two, or mm -hmm. five years. Mm -hmm. That was unthinkable some years ago, and yet there is no legal mechanism for controlling that kind of surveillance today. And those are but some of the most obvious and simple examples. So the question, I mean, and we should probably at least mm -hmm. note that all your email, all your location information, uh, all your tweets, all of your emails, uh, all of your all of your communications through certainly for any handheld device and generally through any stationary device as well is open season there's open season on it for the government who wants to go fishing mm -hmm. in there or fishing in there however you <laughs> right. wish to spell that and so the notion that the, there is legal protection that is really uh, effective in any way to protect privacy given the advances in mm -hmm. technology 
I, I think the, I, the whole notion is spurious. So we've had government officials say, you don't have anything to worry about unless you've done something wrong. Chris, what do you say in response? Well, for many people, that's probably true. They lead boring lives. They like boring lives. I like my boring <laughs> life. Um, but I depend upon newspaper reporters and their confidential sources. And when I disclosed the Army's spying, I didn't just simply tell what I learned in the briefing. I quietly went around the country like a reporter and recruited 125 of the Army's own agents to blow the whistle on them. Most confidentially, because they were happy if I went to prison, but mm -hmm. they, they had other things to do. Um, they were my confidential sources, and I promised them that I would go to prison rather than disclose their identities. Today, it would be much harder for me to protect their identities. It would be harder because the government has so many ways to get at our communications. For one thing, they'd probably get in touch with me by email. That's a very stupid thing to do. Mm -hmm. Or they'd call me on the phone. That's silly. The government can record all my phone calls. I'm sure they're doing it now, as they're doing it with yours. Uh, and then when they're ready, they can search it. Well, I don't think we ought to have that power relationship in this country because it silences people. It prevents us from knowing what the government's doing. They know what we're doing, but we don't know what they're doing. That gets the system wrong. It's backward. Bill, you alluded to this, and, and Chris has written about the <clears throat> privatization of these kinds of issues where the government is now relying on private corporations to do their surveillance work for them. Could you comment on that and, and the, the risk that that puts society in? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's not a new concept that we've had a military-industrial complex. Uh, the idea that the government and, let me put it in a more affirmative statement, the government and uh, telecommunications company work hand in glove and they have mm -hmm. for many years. So as long as the government can have access to the computer networks of the large telecommunications companies, why do it yourself when mm -hmm. those companies will do all the work for you and all you need to do is put a thin microfiber into a computer and voila, you've got all of Verizon's information. You have all of the emails and all of the telephone calls and all of the electronic transmissions, all of it nicely collected and easily deciphered for the government. So the government is doing a lot of it. The notion that it's all private companies is wrong too, but there's a massive amount of information being gathered and stored and the government has just various ways of getting its, its hands on it, some of it through its own means and some of its own mm -hmm. surveillance, and a lot through the telecommunications companies. And of course, we serve up a lot of it to the government. I mean, Facebook, I mean, there's this, the irony of uh, Zuckerman complaining about the government mm -hmm. misusing Facebook for surveillance purposes is really poignant. Uh, after all, Facebook is all about not allowing barriers to privacy. Everything should be shared with everyone. And people give up massive amounts of information. And of course, all of the networks of all the friends and all the friends of the friends. And the government is thrilled that you've just given them all of this information about who are your friends and who do you talk to and who have you seen. And thank you for your picture because that really helps with our, uh, uh, our, our identification programs that we have. And then we can reference this and cross-reference it. And all of this we give up for free, mm -hmm. to which the FBI, the CIA, and Homeland Security says, thank you, in their own way. <laughs> yes, I've tried to tell my children this. I don't know, I'm not on Facebook, either of you? No, I'm not. I actually refused until last week for the purpose, because as you know, I have this book coming That's out, right. and everyone <laughs> says, that is how you are going to promote the book. So they're going to learn a lot about the book and whoever likes the book. And I'm afraid right, that's about, about you. <laughs> well, they're going to learn something. I, I, I don't think they're going to learn anything they don't always <laughs> really know, but they'll learn something. Great. Uh, Chris, tell us about the evolution of your thinking on the Snowden case. Well, at the beginning, I was somewhat skeptical. <clears throat> There was no question that he was a man of great courage or naivete, 
Oh, both. And I always think courage and naivete go together very well. I could not tell. People kept asking me, is he a hero or is he a villain? And I said, I don't know. Hmm. Let's see how he handles the information. He's obviously got a lot of it. And misusing that kind of information can get people killed. Uh, and those of us who are trained in the intelligence business know rather exquisitely just how foolish disclosures can get people into trouble. So I was wary at first. I praised him for his courage, and I praised the information that he'd given out to date, but I withheld my judgment uh, to see, until I could see how it was being handled. And what he did was quite responsible. He said, I'm not going to try to disclose all this myself, and I won't be able to because the government's going to be on me uh, totally, like a blanket. So he gave it to a number of responsible journalists, journalists who were very careful with their sourcing and very careful to consult experts about the implications of what it was they might be disclosing. And I have seen no evidence that Glenn Greenwald, or Laura Petraeus, or Barton Gilman, or any of the others who have handled that material have acted in an irresponsible manner. And while the government has made vague statements to the effect that the information has harmed American foreign policy or harmed uh, American agents, I see no evidence of that at all. And so uh, Ed Snowden's become something of a hero to me yeah. and the people he worked with. You don't do this stuff alone. I didn't do my things alone. I worked with members of Congress. I worked with uh, responsible journalists. I even met some irresponsible journalists <laughs> and had to put, shut them down. Uh, Snowden has done very well. And basically, he's been out of it since he uh, left China because he couldn't take any of that stuff with him. Uh, and he gave it all away while he was still in China to Americans. Mm -hmm. Bill, since 9-11, people have been more willing to sacrifice civil liberties for the sake of security. How do we balance the two? Yeah, I, I disagree with the notion that there is a tension between the two. The idea that you have to sacrifice liberty in order to be safer, I think is wrong. Mm -hmm. So take the government's prison pro prison program, which mm -hmm. is basically, we're going to collect everything we can about as many people as we can for as long as we can, and we'll store it forever. That's basically our government's mm -hmm. policy. And as Chris has pointed out, that, that way of dealing with intelligence is self-defeating. I mean, the governments will say, and I think this is true, that finding a terrorist is like finding a needle in a haystack. You really have to comb through a lot of mm -hmm. information in order to get to that. Now, there are two things wrong with that notion about essentially collecting lots and lots of data on many, 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 many people most of them have nothing to do with what you're supposedly looking for. And one of the issues, of course, is that it antagonizes and makes hostile the communities you need to get really reliable information because in this day and age, the best intelligence, the most accurate intelligence, and the most actionable intelligence is human intelligence. People say, you know what, I know so-and-so is doing something and I'm telling you about it. That works infinitely better and more effectively than all of this massive communication intercepts put together. The other thing is, is that the collection of the data isn't self-defeating for the reason that if you're looking for a needle in a haystack, the idea that the way to find the needle is to make the haystack a thousand or ten thousand or a million or a billion times bigger is stupid and self-defeating. So. And that's the government's policy. Let's just make the haystack from here to the next galaxy. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. somehow that will make us safer. That's wrong. It does, of course, gives them lots of information to use for many, many other purposes other than for allegedly fighting terrorism. So I think that the policy is self-defeating. Mm -hmm. The notion that we have to sacrifice our freedom and our privacy in order to help them make the haystack as big as possible is wrong. You've both written about the rights of detainees in Guantanamo. Chris, you have a book on torture. Tell us a bit about the themes in that book. 
The title of the book is Getting Away with Torture. Uh, I began to write about the torture because I recognized as soon as George Bush's military order came out on November 13th, 19, uh, 2001, they planned to torture people because they said, we will not use the normal rules of criminal evidence. Once they said they would not use the rules of criminal evidence, they'd make it up as they went along, I knew they wanted to torture people. So I stopped the book I was writing and started a new one. Uh, and then I discovered that uh, there was a whole legion of very good reporters digging into the factual story. They didn't need one more digger. Uh, what they needed was an analysis of it. And so I began to analyze how it was we came to that and how the bureaucracy was urged to do it and how lawyers were complicit in essentially a conspiracy to commit torture. That's what it was, led from the White House by White House lawyers operating under the vice president's direction and according to the president, his direction, um, carried out in the so-called Department of Justice, which is one of the great oxymorons of our time, and uh, essentially writing regulations so that people would feel free to torture. They called it their get out of jail free card. Now you don't write laws for that purpose, not in this country. And so I wrote about that. And then I wrote about the cover up and finally the Obama administration, which has not only helped to cover up the conspiracy to commit torture, but has retained the powers. It's never denied those powers. It just says we won't do it as a matter of choice. And then it's gone beyond it to assassinate people by pilotless drones flown from Nevada. Hmm. Tell us about the, the secret court. The FISA court? <clears throat> well, it's not a secret in the sense we know it exists, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act court. Do we know anything else about it? We know that once upon a time, out of the thousands and thousands and thousands of applications that the government has made for various surveillance permissions, it turned it down and that was overturned by the really super secret appellate division of the Fields Court, Fields uh, FISA Court, which I think has met once to reverse the one time that the FISA Court actually turned the government down. The government has asked for various kinds of surveillance permission, permission for various kinds of surveillance. The theory of the FISA Court was to go after foreign intelligence agents. That's why I call it the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. It was never intended to be used against people in the United States. It was never intended to be used against uh, individuals or groups who were viewed as political enemies of the administration. It was never intended to be used to do wholesale surveillance of individuals or groups who have politics that differ from the mainstream. And that's what the FISA court is. Now, there is one aspect of the FISA court that I think is actually beneficial, which is that because there are lawyers that have to sign their name saying this is happening, there is some, I think, self-regulating that goes on. And I think that may be helpful, although we don't know. There is no lawyer before the court at this point, up to this point, other than the government lawyers. There's no one there except the, the judges who were appointed by the uh, Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, Justice Roberts, whose ideology on these matters is very clear. The FISA court never turns down a request that the government has, and I think that the broad scale, uh, the broad scale of the uh, authorizations that have been granted uh, have been shocking when they've come to light. And I guess I'm wrong about one thing. There's, there's one case in which even the FISA court, when the government came back and said this is what we did, was upset. Uh, but by and large, uh, calling something a court that is there with the rubber stamp in hand ready to say aloud mm -hmm. isn't much of a court. I would submit it's not really a court in our sense of the word because its decisions do not establish precedent 
in any way that can be tested throughout the legal system, which is what mm -hmm. our system of precedent does. Right, and and the idea of a court, which I think I think Chris's point is really well taken, is that there are both sides arguing, but in this so-called court, there's only one side present, and they write decisions so they can be reviewed, which this court doesn't do because its decisions mm -hmm. can't are never reviewed. And the, as Chris points out, the pre, there is no precedent; they make it up as they go along, and the. The idea of a court is that it's fair and equitable as opposed to stacked with the judges of a certain ideology. So I agree. Calling it a court is giving it more of a uh, aura of fairness and, and uh, discretion and thoughtfulness that I think that, that is justified by the facts of how it actually functions. Mm -hmm. Those court orders I would not call warrants. Mm -hmm. Warrants, according to our Constitution, should be based upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not what they are. I testified against the FISA court in 1976 uh, while I was working for the Church Committee, Senator Church's Select mm -hmm. Committee on Intelligence. And I called the warrants uh, pseudo warrants because they're essentially, uh, if you think you have a need for it, we'll authorize the surveillance. And the categories were very broad and easily expanded. And in 2004, they were radically expanded for bulk warrants. Warrants had always been specific since the time of James Otis and the Writs of Assistance case in Boston in 1763. We had been arguing for specific warrants. And we had adopted that in the Massachusetts Constitution and the, Con the federal Constitution. But in 2004, the secret court secretly said, no, we can give you a warrant to collect thousands, millions of records. That's not a warrant. That's credentials. Thank you so much. We are out of time. Um, luckily, this is a two-part segment, and so we will be seeing you again. Uh, I want to take your class. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much.